This case study is an 81-year-old community nursing home resident with dementia, peripheral arterial disease, hypertension, non-ambulatory, and presents with a wound that is fluid-filled, but there's no drainage, it's dry. It's about three by, three by four centimeters on the heel. Here's a close-up. And if we look at this, we can see there's actually some blood-tinged uh, exudate within the wound itself, or within that blister itself. So what do you think this might be? Are we looking at an unstageable pressure injury? Is this a hemorrhagic bolus? Is this a stage two pressure injury? Or is this a deep tissue pressure injury? It's a deep tissue pressure injury. So the deep tissue pressure injuries are usually, again, a result of pressure to an existing area. Friction and shear can be contributing factors with this. And with a patient like this with an intact blister, the question comes up uh, as well as far as whether you would want to uh, leave that blister intact or whether you might want to open that blister and drain it. Think about what you might want to do. Your treatment options should really include some type of a bulky protective dressing to hopefully protect that wound and keep it from further trauma. In some cases it may resorb, in many cases it may break and you will find a, a more significant amount of tissue damage underneath. But you want to protect that wound and offload, that's very, very important. You want to also consider in some cases if it's available uh, mostly in the acute care setting or in the wound care settings, there's a product uh, or a treatment called Ultramist, which is a non-contact form of uh, ultrasound that can help. And there is some research that indicates that it may be helpful in treating and mitigating the damage of deep tissue pressure injuries. Just something for you to be aware of. Heel flotation, of course, is extremely important. And even if you don't have access to a particular product to offload, you can float the heels on a pillow, you can float the heels on cushions, and as long as there is no pressure to the heel, if you can pass a piece of paper underneath the heels, then you have, in effect, floated the heels. So in summary for deep tissue pressure injuries, this is sometimes considered the other type of pressure injury. It's kind of the black sheep that nobody wants to talk about. You want to always offload pressure and flip the heels. Topical therapy will be determined by the appearance. If it's an intact blister, you want to protect it and keep it from lysing. Once it opens up, then the condition or an appearance of the wound are going to dictate what type of care you're going to provide. Keep the intact blisters intact. Nutrition, always nutrition. Continence care, especially if it's occurring over an area in the uh, lower pelvis or sacral area. And certainly you want to look at the perfusion status. If a patient has peripheral arterial disease, such as this patient does, then the potential for healing certainly may be compromised. And again, is your goal of therapy here aggressive or conservative? That's a very important piece of the equation that you need to always consider. So here is uh, case study number six. This is a 68-year-old smoker. He has an albumin of 3.0, very faint pedal pulses. He's got a dry wound with no exudate, and there is no fluctuance with palpation. This is located in the left great toe. Here's a close-up. And you can see it's very dry and desiccated on the first digit. He's got a, an area that looks like a, a corn, a hyperkeratotic area on that um, interphalangeal joint on that second toe. And then he's got another area on the toe tip. You can see that the skin is very dry and scaly and flaking. So what do you think this is? Is this a traumatic wound, a pressure injury? Do we have a fungal infection here? That second and third toe looked kind of nasty and kind of of concern. Or do we have an arterial ulcer? These are your options. This is an arterial ulcer. It may have started with a little bit of trauma, uh, such as an ill-fitting pair of shoes. In some cases, these can be very spontaneous in their development. 
but you can clearly see that by all, all means, he really has very compromised blood flow. So, what are your treatment options? Do you think that vascular studies or a consult is warranted? What kind of topical therapy would you consider? How would you fix something like this, or is it fixable? Here is another example of somebody who has significant impairment in their circulation, and we can see that they actually have dry gangrene on the distal parts of their digits. So something like this would certainly require a vascular surgery consult. If the wound is dry, you would keep it dry. You would want to offload pressure as much as possible. And then you would probably decide, if you were the provider, uh, to consider some vascular surgery uh, options, such as uh, arterial Doppler studies, or speak with your attending or the provider that's in charge of the care of that patient. Keep in mind that with arterial ulcers, they are, they are characteristic of having trophic changes. They occur in the distal areas. Arterial Doppler and vascular studies are going to be an important part of the plan of care. A vascular consult might be indicated. Avoid repetitive trauma and pressure to those areas. Keep the dry gangrene dry. You could either do a dry protective dressing or some, in a case like this, paint it with a little betadine. Moist wound healing is applicable only if the wound is open. If the wound is not open, if it's dry gangrene or dry eschar, keep it dry. Case study number seven. This is a patient who has Parkinson's dysphagia immobility. He uses a PEG tube for nutritional supplementation, and he was admitted to the post-acute care after fall and hip fracture. Um, he's status post-ORAF or uh, open reduction internal fixation. So you can see there is a lot of dry necrotic tissue, dry eschar, on all of the aspects of the lateral surfaces of his feet and also in between his toes. So this looks like it is an arterial ulcer. Is it trauma? Is this end stage skin failure, pressure injury, or gangrene? This is a device-related pressure injury. This is a patient who does have some compromise in terms of poor vascular flow, but this is a result of a Prevalon boot, which is actually a really good product that was probably put on a little bit too tightly and the patient didn't have the benefit of, of periodic assessment. So in a situation like this, offloading is going to be absolutely critical. It may be certainly uh, worth considering uh, vascular studies, but given this patient's age and other comorbidities, it's likely that probably a more palliative approach might be important. And in terms of end-stage skin failure, that is an important concept. That is uh, the idea that sometimes patients, just like patients have organ failures, it is thought that sometimes patients will have end-stage skin failure. And that usually involves patients that will continue to deteriorate and have skin breakdown regardless of the care being provided. Not necessarily pressure injuries per se, but that is certainly something that can be seen as a patient becomes closer to the end of their, their natural life or a patient who is terminally ill. This is a gentleman who has diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, morbid obesity. He also has significant neuropathy. Six month history of non-healing ulcer to the right foot in between his fourth and fifth digit. He's notorious for wearing ill-fitting shoes. And we can see that this is a deep wound for, for being on the foot. It's greater than a centimeter deep and it probes to the bone. So is this a diabetic foot ulcer? Is this an arterial ulcer, a traumatic ulcer, or do you think something else? It's a little bit of everything, actually. Um, this is one of those situations where sometimes it's not always clear what's going on. We know the patient is diabetic, so that's a contributing factor. However, the wound is really more in between the digits, which is consistent with an arterial type of wound. But he has a history of ill-fitting shoes, so there's some trauma as well. The other thing that we are concerned about is that this wound probes to bone, and anytime there is probing to bone or potential for bone exposure, we are always concerned about the risk for osteomyelitis or infection in the bone. So as part of our workup and treatment, 
Some of the things that we might want to consider would be uh, screening x-rays, just to screen for the possibility of any bone involvement. If there is a question of osteomyelitis, then sometimes an MRI might give us a little bit better ideal. Uh, it's a little bit more sensitive and specific for osteomyelitis than an x-ray. We might consider a wound culture if we are concerned about infection. And referral to podiatry um, for a possible bone biopsy might be a consideration. And if we send the patient for vascular studies, depending on the results, that may require a vascular consult as well. So he's got a lot going on. Osteomyelitis can be acute or chronic. In the acute stage, it's usually a result of infiltration of the polymorphonucleosites. Um, the, wound, the wound will have a particular appearance uh, radiographically as compared to chronic osteomyelitis. And for the most part, it really is going to be a matter of whether aggressive versus con conservative treatment is required. Typically with osteomyelitis, if it's a more conservative treatment, it may require an infectious disease consult and perhaps six to eight weeks of antibiotic therapy. If a more aggressive approach is warranted, then that might require some surgery, surgical resection, and um, certainly treatment with an advanced wound care product. And you want to rule out other, other etiologies as well. So treatment options, I think we've talked a little bit about this, and, and it's also important to consider anything else related to his care that might impact his ability to heal. This is a 79-year-old who has a history of uh, alcohol and tobacco abuse, weight loss, it's kind of a thin, wiry guy, peripheral arterial disease, and has a history about a month ago, month and a half ago perhaps, of a right lower extremity bypass that developed a subsequent infection. And just looking at this wound, you can see he's got several different areas. More proximally on his leg, he's got a, a couple of uh, dry fibrin scabs. And more proximally, he's got an open wound that is full thickness and depth. There's quite a bit of slough around the wound. And there is some peri-wound redness or erythema that we can see. Here's a closer look at that particular wound. So we can see that the wound is open. There's a lot of slough. The edges are very uneven. They don't look very good. And we see a little bit of granulation, but we do see a lot of non-viable tissue. And there is quite a bit of redness around that wound. So, do you think this is an arterial ulcer? Could this be a dehist surgical wound? Is it a venous ulcer? Is it a factitious wound? In other words, something that was caused by the patient. Or is it none of the above? This is a dehist surgical wound. Again, this is a patient who had a history of right lower extremity bypass. The uh, bypass site became infected and opened up and separated. And because of the tissue damage, it now presents as more of an open chronic type of wound. So with the surgical wound, what are our treatment and management options? Certainly local wound care is going to be appropriate, uh, perhaps an antimicrobial uh, product or a debriding agent might be appropriate, or perhaps a combination. Uh, Santol or collagenase and hydrofera blue might be one option. Uh, Medihoney might be an option. Uh, just plain silver with some excisional debridement might be an option. You have, you have different choices. You also want to determine the perfusion on a patient like this. Now, he's had a history of bypass, but the concern might be is that bypass graft still patent. So certainly getting with the vascular surgeon and seeing if he or she would like some repeat imaging studies or flow studies would be very important. And he's also very thin, so looking at the nutritional status is going to be very important with a patient such as this. And fortunately for him, after some antibiotic treatment, uh, he was sent for vascular follow-up, graft was intact. And with appropriate uh, antimicrobial treatment and wound care, he did start to achieve improvement and he did go on to ultimately heal. Again, debridement. I continue to emphasize the importance of it, but this is again showing a before and after. Debridement is a critical mainstay of wound care. Case study number 10. Our 92-year-old has a history of COPD, 
hypertension, osteoarthritis, had a recent uh, total knee replacement. Chronic steroid user, has a history of weight loss, and he's a smoker. And he took a fall. He was a community nursing home resident, but he was outside, decided to walk around in the garden and took a fall. And this is what we have. And this is a close-up. So you can see we've got multiple open areas on his arm, and then around those areas we have a lot of bruising or ecchymosis or sometimes what's called purpura. And that is, again, extravasation of some of the blood from some of the smaller capillaries into the subcutaneous tissue. Um, certainly looks, looks very, very impressive. And this is another area here uh, where you can see that the edges are very jagged and irregular. So the question is, what do you think this is? Is this a skin tear without flap loss? Is this a traumatic skin tear with flap loss? Would this be considered a laceration injury? Or do we have a tissue avulsion here? It's a traumatic skin tear with flap loss. Etiology, so think about what some of those risk factors might be for the development of this type of a wound. Uh, certainly skin tears are becoming a little bit more on the forefront of, of our attention as wound care providers because in, a, in effect they're actually more common than pressure ulcers. And the uh, International Society on uh, Skin Tears uh, was convened in 2013 and they really have a lot of very good consensus statements on the assessment and management of skin tears. But we certainly know from the literature that some of the risk factors for developing skin tears would be a history of previous skin tears, nutritional compromise, steroid use, mobility issues would be another factor, previous skin tears, um, certainly uh, patients that have a fear of falling can also be considered cognitive impairment, mobility, uh, any kind of neurological impairment. So certainly there are a number of factors that put this patient at risk for the development of skin tears. So what would our treatment options be? This just lists again some of the risk factors. I've already skimmed across some of them, but this is a more comprehensive list for your review. And as you can appreciate, especially in the elderly population and in the post-acute care setting, these risk factors are very common among a large number of our patients. So almost all of our patients, you really could conclude, are at the risk for the development of skin tears or skin trauma. The classification is type 1 is no skin flap loss. This is where you have a linear flap that can be repositioned and in some cases, if that's the case, steri-stripped back together and then covered with a protective dressing. You have type 2, which is partial flap loss, where there is some loss of the flap. It can't be completely reapproximated and there's some open wound or subcutaneous tissue exposed. Or total flap loss, exposing the entire wound bed. And as you can appreciate, the more serious these are, the more difficult they are to heal. So in terms of a patient with a skin care, uh, this is just a nice algorithm for you for your reference. But your local care is really going to be focused on stopping any bleeding if it happens to occur and really making sure that you are using non-traumatic dressings. I really prefer non-adherent dressings for these types of patients. So your non-adherent dressings might include um, adaptic, xeriform, silicone dressings, petrolatum impregnated dressings. All of those are certainly very, very appropriate. The use of jerry sleeves. Jerry sleeves are basically fabric sleeves that extend from uh, the palm of the hand to just above the elbow. Can be very, very helpful for protecting against recurrent trauma. If that's not an option, then encouraging long sleeve shirts, encouraging long sleeve long pants rather than shorts, anything that will help to protect that skin and, pre and prevent any further or mitigate you know, the risk of any type of further trauma, especially if they end up with a fall or other type of issue. Skin hydration internally and externally are absolutely critical. Adequate hydration is important for our population for so many different reasons, but also the application of external uh, lubricants or emollients can be very critical as far as management. So case study number 11, 
This is an 89-year-old male, has a history of adult failure to thrive, has some weight loss, he's got some essential tremors, history of falls in the past, and functional urinary incontinence. Because of his mobility issues, he can't always get to the bathroom on time and sometimes has episodes of incontinence because of his impaired mobility. So we can see here that this is an area in the intergluteal space. Um, it's kind of irregular in shape. There's some redness. It looks rather irritated and kind of proximally there's a little bit of what looks like some maceration in that wound. So the question that we have here is, is this a stage 2 pressure injury? Is this a fungal infection? Is this moisture associated skin damage or MASD? Or is it just a generalized dermatitis? This is moisture associated skin damage. And very important, this is often associated or misinterpreted as a stage 2 pressure injury. This is a direct result of his incontinence and probably some limited hygiene because of his mobility issues, having a little trouble reaching around to the back to take care of his needs. So we have moisture associated skin damage. So MASD, important aspects of care is appropriate skin cleansing, pH balance cleansers, avoiding anything harsh that's got an elevated pH, continence care is important. For somebody like this, the regular application of a skin film or a barrier would be extremely helpful and beneficial. Trying to look at strategies to reduce friction or shear. And if possible, unless it's avoidable, diapers really need to be limited. You know, diapers really are, or adult incontinence briefs, if you will, are really something that should be reserved for certain occasions. But if the patient has some degree of incontinence, they may be better served with maybe a small liner in their briefs or boxers. Um, certainly trying to keep those areas um, as exposed to air as possible is very, very important. So to the extent that we can, we want to try to avoid excessive use of briefs for MASD. So this is a nice little summary, I think, of some of the common types of chronic wounds that you will see. And for your reference, you can see that the venous versus arterial versus neuropathic are being compared side by side for your review, and hopefully that will provide a, a useful reference for you. I have talked about infection before, but keeping in mind that assessing and treating infection is very, very important and keeping in mind that infection is really part of a continuum. You don't go from non-infected to infected. You typically go from contaminated to colonized to critically colonized to infected. So definitions vary, but the gold standard is, again, presence of organisms greater than 10 to the fifth gram of tissue, the presence of local and systemic indicators, and also some of the signs and symptoms may depend on the type of wound that you're looking at. Classic symptoms, pain, redness, in duration, or that firmness when you palpate, warmth, perial and exudates, fever, leukocytosis. In chronic wounds, things you also want to consider would be a sudden increase in exudates or change in color or consistency in the wound bed. If it's dusky or you've got friable granulation, that could be a problem. New onset pain when you didn't have it, or an unusual odor or new odor or the wound is just not progressing or it's going backwards. Those are certainly some big red flags to be aware of. Other indications of problems with chronic wounds. Sometimes if a patient is diabetic or has a diabetic ulcer, if they're suddenly having pain in the neuropathic extremity when they didn't before, or they have elevated blood glucose levels, that may be early indications of infection in someone with a diabetic ulcer. In pressure injuries, if there is increased tunneling or undermining, that may be an indication. And that's usually a result of some proteolytic lysis of some of the dermal tissues. In other words, that infection is causing further damage and breakdown. Typically, if you have a wound with a tunnel, a tunnel is usually a result of some type of a previous or current infection. In venous ulcers, you will see an increase in exudates. The problem that can be difficult with venous ulcers is that symptoms are often masked by the presence of that hyperpigmentation or hemosiderosis, 
or that firmness, that lipodermatosclerosis may mask in duration. So you really want to pay very close attention to what's going on with your patient. And in arterial ulcers, the trophic or ischemic changes may, may mask or be misinterpreted. Many times a patient who has significant peripheral vascular disease will have something called dependent ruber where when they are sitting with their feet in a dependent position, their feet might be fire engine red. And to somebody who is seeing them for the first time, that could be easily interpreted as a cellulitis. However, if you were to elevate those legs, you would see that the color would basically uh, return to normal. That's called dependent ruber. Also keep in mind that patients generally don't have cellulitis bilaterally. It's usually unilateral. So if there's redness in both legs, you want to kind of look at maybe other causes for that redness. Again, with colonization, wounds can have the existence of bacteria in the wound, and they can still heal with no problems, provided they receive the benefit of appropriate topical care and systemic care. Now with critical colonization, we have so many bacteria in there that now it's starting to look a little bit disturbed and the wound is no longer wanting to progress. Another example where there is just such a heavy bile burden in the wound that the wound is just sitting there, it's static, it's just not looking happy at all. So in terms of infection, what we're looking at here is certainly uh, a widespread cellulitis that is ascending on this particular patient. We can see that there is a lot of significant erythema. If we were to palpate this, we would find that it was extremely red. It was extremely warm, very tender to the touch. And that would be very characteristic of a wound infection. And that brings us to a conclusion. Thank you very much.